Thanks for coming to the uh, next uh, session, and uh, this talk is going to be by, oops, let me get my papers out here, um, by Rob Bradley, and he's going to be talking about energy, the return of Ellis Wyatt, question mark, and um, I've known Rob Bradley for quite a number of uh, years. He found the founder and CEO of the Institute for Energy Research, which I believe is in uh, Houston uh, or somewhere down there in Texas where they actually drill for oil. He's a, um, uh, an adjunct scholar at various places, Cato, for, uh, Cato Institute, CEI, I think, uh, uh, other places. A um, couple of things about him. First of all, he's been dealing with energy issues since I think he started a book in, on oil. Uh, gas and government uh, in uh, like around 1980, so he's been sort of plowing this field for, for some time. The other interesting thing about uh, Rob Bradley is he worked for, I think it was like 17 years for Enron, uh, for Ken Lay. And um, so, and one of the things he's talked about and written about extensively since the um, uh, fall of Enron is exactly what happened. Why did that, uh, what went wrong with their uh, culture, their, their corporate culture, and, and, and so forth. And um, he's got a, a, a trilogy of books, uh, two of them out already, the capitalism, at, I think capitalism at work is one of them, and um, uh, a book on essentially political economy, and I've, I've, uh, I call them to your attention. He kind of looks at the different, uh, he's got a history one out, I think you've got a global view out, and you've got a third one coming out, and so if you're really interested in these sorts of things, I really call your attention to his book um, on that. By the way, interesting story, he's got an interview in uh, the New Individual Star magazine, uh, I think it's the April, um, May 2006 uh, one, and the cover story is his interview with, about uh, his experiences with Ken Lay, the rise and fall of Ken Lay, and literally, when we were at a summer seminar in 2006, and the magazine was at the printers, uh, that was when Ken Lay uh, decided to die. And I don't think it had any direct relationship to uh, uh, the article coming out, but uh, that was an interesting coincidence. So you can go on our website if you want to read that interview uh, with Rob Barley about Ken Lay. But anyway, today he's going to be talking about energy and uh, uh, is it time for the return of Ellis Wyatt? And of course, energy is one of the big issues uh, today. Uh, by the way, before I bring him up, I'm supposed to make a couple of announcements. There is going to be a group photograph this afternoon at 4.45, um, and uh, there will be a uh, con this conference photo. It's going to be uh, in the presidential ballroom, which I believe is this ballroom right here. So 4.45, please be here for the group photo. Shortly after the group photo, um, there's going to be a meeting of the scholarship students, so please track down Will Thomas or Aaron Rainwater uh, right after the uh, photograph. And finally, um, comment uh, or session comments and questionnaires. Uh, in your binder, you have these lurid yellow uh, packets uh, of uh, session rating sheets, uh, which you can use to let us know which ones you liked, which ones you didn't like, and to give us feedback. We also have, if you want to go online, Survey Monkeys, another. Uh, way you can do this because we really do want to know what you guys think, what you like, what you don't like, what you want to see more of. You know, this is kind of the capitalist customer based approach to doing a conference. So please give us your feedback um, uh, as well. So, but anyway, turning to energy without further ado, uh, Rob Bradley is going to talk about one of the things he's an expert on, and Rob's a great speaker. So, Rob, prove me right. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, I have a tough act to follow, uh, given what we just heard in this room, uh, uh, back, to, back to Earth. Um, the title of my talk is Energy, the Return of Ellis Wyatt. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about um, um, Ayn Rand. There he is. And Ellis made it from uh, part one to part two, right? at least a picture of him, and uh, maybe he'll be in part three. I don't know. But um, uh, the th I have four themes of the talk. Uh, the first one is uh, Ayn Rand's use of energy in Atlas Shrugged, which is very fascinating uh, to an energy specialist uh, for reasons I'll get into uh, here in a minute. I want to examine uh, the persona of uh, Ellis uh, Wyatt II, uh, his role uh, in the novel. Uh, and I'd like to 
Hughes um, uh, Rand's views of energy and Ellis Wyatt as a segue into looking at the U.S. energy experience. We have about 160 years of an active oil and gas uh, industry here in the U.S., and there's a number of lessons that uh, come out of that. And uh, finally, uh, looking at current energy debates from an objectivist perspective, uh, what are some insights uh, that we have? And I often wish that Ayn Rand was living and writing today during uh, this current energy uh, era with all the political debates and uh, uh, going on in Washington, D.C. and uh, on the, uh, in the states because the way that she could eviscerate the other side is something that I don't think anyone uh, uh, is able to do uh, in her absence. And I think back to the Ayn Rand letter and some of her commentary during the 1970s energy crisis and Richard Nixon uh, and a lot of it is uh, just classic. Um, I'll begin my energy talks with uh, some energy fundamentals. Uh, first uh, is that energy is the resource of resources, what Julian Simon called the master resource. You need energy to find energy and you need energy to find any other minerals and you need a lot of energy to transform resources from uh, uh, into more important resources. One example being uh, desalinization, taking salt water and turning it into uh, drinkable water. Um, there's plants that are up now, a number of plants being proposed, and the major cost component of that is energy. Um, so the more affordable uh, the energy, uh, the more resources can get transformed. Uh, also, energy, uh, industrial energy, the energy we're using here, uh, is not a natural resource, but it's a man-made resource. And mineral industries should be thought of as manufacturing uh, industries, and you get into a lot of trouble as, uh, on a business plane uh, and on a public policy plane when you think that somehow oil and gas and other minerals are different from other goods, um, uh, that somehow they're more scarce or their price has to go up. And this is just uh, not the case if you look at the history of mineral resources uh, throughout uh, history. Uh, there's uh, not much price difference between so-called depletable resources and other uh, so-called non-depletable resources. Uh, but it's uh, the energy that we use, uh, the oil, gas, coal, the electricity, is very much um, a man-made uh, resource. Uh, and the point here is that uh, resources uh, really come from the mind and not the ground. Uh, two other points, uh, energy, is a continuous flow of power in the great majority of applications. You have to have energy on demand and it has to be uninterrupted. We don't want the flickering lights. Uh, we don't want uh, power to um, equipment such as your computers to go on and off. Uh, it, uh, it, it raises havoc. Uh, and the reason this is very important is that the so-called green energies of wind and solar uh, in particular are not industrial grade energies in the sense that they are not, they do, don't generate continuous power such as power um, from conventional sources uh, such as uh, oil, gas, coal fired electricity or even nuclear power that are, uh, are very predictable, very constant and give you power at all times. Uh, wind and solar are intermittent. Uh, if they don't have battery backup, uh, which is very expensive, uh, these energy sources go on and off. And for the grid, wind and solar electricity are parasitic energies. They can, the, the only reason they can contribute is that you have fossil fuel uh, plants producing electricity that are always there to fill in when the wind doesn't blow and the sun uh, doesn't shine. 
And finally, we can think of uh, free market energies today, consumer driven, consumer chosen, as oil, gas, and coal. And the looter energies would be ethanol, wind power, and on-grid solar. Now, by on-grid, I mean uh, solar that competes against electricity from other sources where you can plug something in. There's, uh, solar does have a free market niche, and that is off the grid in very remote places where you can't plug something in. Um, uh, there are free market solar companies, uh, and even some of these free market uh, niche solar companies have complained about all the government subsidies to the solar industries that brings in new entrants uh, and overcrowds the industry and makes it worse for everyone. But uh, you can uh, distinguish between the looter industries uh, and free market in industries in the U.S. Looter industries, probably four to five percent of the total amount, uh, totally uh, government dependent, government enabled, and nuclear would be somewhere in between these two. Uh, uh, there's a lot of government subsidies, but there's government penalties too. Uh, but nuclear really cannot compete uh, uh, against uh, gas-fired electricity in particular. Now, in Atlas Shrugged, uh, energy is a, is a major theme. And on a literal level, we have uh, Galt's motor that's going to add 10 years to everyone's life and do all these wonderful things. Uh, we have Wyatt Oil, uh, uh, making uh, oil from shale, and there's pipelines too uh, to get the oil uh, to market. Uh, there's lots of talk about motive power, uh, diesel power, uh, diesel fuels, uh, um, the energy source for uh, Taggart's trains. Taggart Interco Intercontinental uh, have a number of tank cars to... Uh, move Wyatt's uh, oil to market to, to refineries. Uh, there's Daniger Coal, and there's uh, 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 electrical generation power plants and electricity uh, that's a major uh, part of the story. On a philosophical, humanistic level, uh, there's a definite theme that, uh, ener that energy is man's enabler, uh, that energy usage is good and that shortages in forced conservation, the conservation decrees from government are bad. There's a lot of uh, uh, alliteration of um, light being good and darkness being bad. But overall, there's an assumption in the book, or, or, and it's a good assumption, that there's basically a market order uh, to energy as uh, there is to transportation and the other industrial sectors, that the market works by itself. Now, Ayn Rand understood uh, Austrian economics on a certain level, uh, that the markets generally worked, uh, that government intervention had unintended consequences, but I'm not sure she really understood the broader concept that we associate uh, mostly with F.A. Hayek of undesigned order or spontaneous order. But Rand's uh, use of government intervention in Atlas Shrugged is very sophisticated. Uh, she talks about oil shortages, and when you have shortages, the government comes in uh, to allocate supply. Uh, they come in to ration supply by decree. Uh, there's coal shortages and electricity uh, shortages. Uh, and it's prophetic on a number of levels, and um, perhaps you can uh, find out the answer um, if Ayn Rand wrote it down, but I'm convinced, looking at her sophisticated use of energy, and particularly the perils of government intervention, that uh, she was very attuned to World War II planning uh, from 1940, uh, 41 through 45, where you had price and allocation controls with uh, oil, coal, uh, and you had uh, physical shortages, you had government rationing, government um, uh, conservation edicts that she saw it all, and this, is, uh, this gave her a lot of insight, real world insight that she used in Atlas Shrugged. But uh, certainly through Ellis Wyatt Rand, 
realize that oil is a master resource. And her, the quote from Atlas Shrugged is, oil is black blood because blood is supposed to feed to give life, and that is what Wyatt Oil has done. Now, who is Ellis Wyatt? Well, there he is, right? Uh, he's an oil man, crusty. Uh, I think he has the engineering mind, like most successful uh, oil men, at least in the upstream or exploration and production uh, sector. He probably began as a roughneck and worked himself up. Might not have uh, much education. The oil industry, oil and gas industry, is full of legendary figures who had very little education, but they had the engineering mind and they got their degree from experience, a school of hard knocks, and they uh, were able to become great uh, uh, business uh, people, uh, starting with an engineering degree. There's a, a saying that ExxonMobil, uh, I think, uh, once used that uh, they like to hire engineers because you can um, teach business to engineers, but you can't teach engineering to business people. So uh, that's probably Wyatt's background. Uh, he's, he's a tough guy, honest, demanding, but he's fair. And uh, finally, we, we would say he's a darn good amateur objectivist, right? Uh, and that leads to uh, um, something I'll talk to in, in just a minute, Wyatt's torch. but. Um, now, Wyatt's breakthrough, and this is really prophetic, uh, uh, is oil shale. Now, if you turn that around to shale oil, that's exactly the technological boom we're going through today, shale oil and shale gas from new uh, extraction technology uh, that people uh, didn't see coming a decade ago and which is now revolutionizing not only the U.S. oil and gas market, but the international market. And all of a sudden, uh, we realize that we don't have decades left of oil and gas. Uh, we probably have centuries. But Rand was focused on oil shale, which is uh, a tremendous source of energy, but uh, it's uh, uneconomic uh, at present. And perhaps in uh, a few centuries, Oil shale would be the next best thing. It's too expensive to produce today, but with the ultimate resource of human ingenuity, to use uh, Julian Simon's term, uh, oil shale can become economic. Uh, the quote from um, Ellis Wyatt here, um, uh, oil shale, how many years ago was it they gave up trying to get oil from shale because it was too expensive? Well, wait till you see the process I've developed. It'll be the cheapest oil ever to splash in their faces and an unlimited supply of it, an untapped supply that will make the biggest oil pool look like a, a mud puddle. Now, the other thing he says here that's very interesting, he says, Hank, you and I will have to build pipelines in all directions. Well, a big part of the energy boom in the United States, and we're certainly seeing it in Houston, Texas, is midstream or pipeline companies that are expanding very rapidly uh, because uh, oil out of the ground uh, uh, isn't a usable resource. You have to get it to refineries, uh, and you need uh, crude oil pipelines to get it to refineries, and you need product pipelines to get it uh, to get the oil, the oil products from the refinery to uh, points of wholesale and then retail. So the pipeline boom or the midstream boom is a major um, uh, a major development that's on the uh, headlines of the business section in uh, Houston papers and, and other uh, papers around the country. Now Wyatt versus the looters. Wyatt is very successful and the looters or thinking, uh, you're really better than us. Uh, 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 Wyatt is successful. He creates a lot of private wealth. The leaders are thinking, can we have that? Uh, we need it uh, for, the, for society's good. And certainly he's a rebel with a cause. And the leaders would say, you can't torch that, even if it's your property. 
And um, here are some um, pictures I just pulled off from the internet. I hope I don't know, owe anyone any money for this. Um, Ed, I'll pass it on. I'll pass on that cost. I'll put it on my expense report. Um, but uh, uh, there you go. Uh, in the quotation uh, from Wyatt, his, his note, uh, when he disappears, I am leaving it as I found it, take over, it's yours. Now, uh, in Atlas Shrugged, uh, Rand is, uh, uh, is very sophisticated with her use of uh, her descriptions of uh, government bureaucracy and uh, uh, particular orders. There's the Bureau of Economic Planning and Natural Resources, there's an excess profits tax, and we had that with oil uh, in 1980, uh, it, it was repealed just five years later. Uh, price controls and conservation mandates, the dynamics of intervention, and the Austrian economist uh, Mises uh, explained very well how you have monetary inflation, prices are going up, the government responds to the problem of higher prices with price controls, Price controls uh, create shortages by discouraging demand and uh, encouraging, I'm sorry, a discouraging supply and encouraging uh, demand. Therefore, the government comes in to solve this problem with allocation orders, rationing orders. So one intervention leads to the other, to the next, and it's a process, an interventionist dynamic, and Rand saw that very uh, clearly, and Peter Betke and other Austrian economists like to use Atlas Shrugged as part of their economics curriculum to uh, uh, talk about this. Um, shortages and breakdown, uh, something that von Mises uh, called planned chaos, and there's always a blame game by regulators. If regulation's not working well, it has to be because of problems in the private sector, uh, the entrepreneurs. Uh, it's not the uh, regulation itself. Now, plan chaos, the, the term of von Mises, basically the more you regulate, the more problems there are, and the more you have to regulate more. <clears throat> so it's the opposite of what F.A. Hayek would call an undesigned market order. Um, and this gets us to the U.S. experience, looking at energy regulation uh, pre-Atlas Shrug, pre-1957. <clears throat> There's a long history here, and my personality is such that I spent uh, several years in the library going through all the old trade journals uh, to uh, understand all this regulation and uh, write a uh, two-volume history of it. Um, believe it or not, um, back in the mid-20s, the problem, the industry problem in uh, the oil industry crisis was we had too much oil rather than not enough. We were finding gush gushers in Texas and Oklahoma and other oil states, and the price of oil got down to about 10 cents a barrel. Now, uh, to put that, to adjust it for inflation, uh, that's about the price that you could buy a bowl of chili at a local diner in East Texas, uh, where the East Texas field was, which was the largest. So the battle cry became dollar oil. We need uh, government intervention to help us reach dollar oil. So uh, the state and federal governments uh, came in with rules that Oil wells could only produce so many barrels a day. It was called market demand proration. And uh, there was a cat and mouse game between the producers that didn't want the government to regulate their wells. And one gentleman, sort of a Ellis Wyatt of his day, built a concrete pillbox over his well controls so that the, Depart uh, the Department of Interior agents couldn't come in and uh, check and see if he was producing too much. This is a little bit of uh, civil disobedience. Uh, but it got so bad that uh, they declared martial law in some of the, in two of the major fields, one in Oklahoma and one in Texas, and they shut down the field and they brought in the National Guard to shut down the field for a few months. Then they reopened it where the 
uh, under very strict regulation. So, um, you know, here's a, an instance, uh, a, a pre-Atlas shrugged of uh, sort of um, a, a, lot of, a lot of government intervention and a little bit of uh, Ellis Wyatt activity. I don't think anyone torched their wells, uh, however. Uh, during World War I and World War II, the government made a decision that they were going to implement price controls on oil and different energies, which created shortages, which created the, the need for rationing. Uh, in World War I, um, shortages uh, led to an edict east of the Mississippi for some months uh, that you could not drive. Uh, if you owned an automobile, you could not drive it on Sunday. So you had the spectacle of horses that were uh, towing cars on Sunday. And uh, some people who would drive on Sunday, maybe the Ellis Wyatt or maybe some of you in here, uh, what uh, other, what your neighbors would do would be to paint your car yellow or they would get your name and license plate and they'd publish the names of the slackers, as they called them, uh, in, the, in the paper. Um, so um, that's what was going on because of uh, price controls creating shortages and government uh, coming in with uh, uh, edicts. Uh, World War II rationing, uh, you actually, uh, with gasoline, like with uh, a number of goods and services, you had a um, ration uh, tickets. And when you bought a gallon of gasoline, uh, you would uh, sh show them your, um, your ration ticket and they would, uh, they would mark it. Um, and again, uh, the problem, this created all sorts of problems where you have a black market, you have counterfeiting, with the ration coupons, uh, you have um, uh, people that are just not using their uh, uh, rations. Um, uh, there's just a lot of different civil obedience here, and you need a lot of, the government needs, needs a lot of personnel to try to regulate this whole thing. And a free market economist would say, don't, uh, uh, don't implement price controls, let prices go up. And the way that uh, the military demand for oil can be balanced with civilian demand for oil is uh, through taxation. If you have a war in an emergency, you need to tax uh, the amount uh, for that. And if the government has more money, more resources, the government is going to be able to outbid the private sector for the oil it needs or the war theaters. Uh, but the worst of all worlds is where uh, you implement price controls and then you're forced to go to allocation systems that uh, uh, promote a lot of civil disobedience and that uh, uh, co it costs a lot of money to try to enforce. And the uh, first prosecution target during World War II under the ration system was a gentleman who, a service station owner that publicly said, the only ration ticket needed in my station is a $1 bill. So there was your, sort of your Ellis Wyatt at work there. Uh, 1970s uh, regulation. Uh, how are we doing on time, Ed? Okay. Um, we think of the energy crisis in the 70s as being related to the oil embargo. And actually the oil embargo exacerbated a shortage that was already occurring because the United States uh, uh, oil market, as in other sectors, was subject to price controls implemented by President Nixon, October 18, 1971. I remember where I was on that day when I heard that he implemented price controls. If you want to uh, read a, a biting critique of Nixon's decision, uh, Ayn Rand's uh, newsletter, which is just fantastic. But prior to the Arab embargo, we had fuel shortages, such as shown by this hearing uh, before Congress. And if you have shortages, what becomes very important? 
energy conservation. So we have sort of the birth of modern energy conservation uh, where the, the government gets very involved on the uh, demand side because of the problems created on the, on the supply side from price controls. And again, this is before the Arab embargo that we were starting to have uh, uh, shortages at the wholesale level for service stations and it was on its way. Um, the uh, Nixon price control order led to different phases and uh, with the Arab embargo, um, uh, that made things worse and we had a decade of price and allocation regulation with um, petroleum that uh, was a real mess. And I know we have students here that probably uh, weren't born at this time, but I was stuck in the gasoline lines, I remember, in the summer of 1979. How many of you here uh, remember uh, being in a gasoline line? We all look a little older than the ones that haven't raised their hand. Well, it's a mess, and there's a lot of civil disobedience. There was fist fights and tensions, and truckers that didn't get their uh, didn't have enough diesel fuel. There was even incidences of uh, rifle shots, and uh, some people were killed. And I remember a, a editorial in the Wall Street Journal, which was one of the best I ever read, called "Buffer of Civility," and it said that. The free market's really a buffer of civility because it works so well. Supply and demand come into being. But when we have price controls, we have civil disobedience and we have people fighting each other and shooting at each other, uh, uh, the exact opposite of the uh, natural market order. And that uh, the free market, uh, freely fluctuating prices and profit loss uh, are really a buffer of civility. Uh, the 70s, we had the energy crisis presidents. Uh, Carter is the most infamous, but uh, Ford certainly didn't help well. And Nixon is really the father of uh, the energy crisis um, and all the problems that uh, occurred. And this is what it was like in the gasoline lines. It took a lot of time. There was a lot of uncertainty, uh, a lot of rules. You could only buy so much gasoline. You could only buy it on certain days, odd even license plate rules. Uh, and it's a real mess. Um, uh, here's uh, something I found that's kind of funny. No gas. And he has a little uh, to your left, I guess. It says, stay happy with laughing gas. A little nit nitrous oxide. And Johnny Carson making jokes about the, uh, all the, everything that's happening in the gasoline lines. Any, anyone remember Johnny Carson? All right, he was the best, you young people. He was the best. Uh, now, I fear what's gonna happen with Obamacare where they have price regulation and they have shortages. You know, if the way we acted in gasoline lines, what's gonna happen in the waiting rooms? of uh, uh, to see physicians. Uh, and what government does when they create a shortage from price controls, then government has new programs to increase supply and to moderate demand. And you can't help but think that in a doctor shortage, uh, the government's gonna get very involved in nutrition uh, and our personal uh, choices to keep us healthy to reduce demand to help with the uh, medical crisis. Uh, energy has been demonized in uh, recent decades in a way that uh, Ellis Wyatt and Ayn Rand uh, uh, didn't cover when she was writing in the uh, 40s and 50s. Um, let's see, uh, here's a, a, a one message here, kill capitalism for it kills the planet. We've all uh, uh, heard of that. Uh, and the problem is that um, we're running out of oil and gas, we're running out of resources. Um, uh, so um, le let me take the major complaints ag against energy today and rephrase it as the looters against uh, Ellis Wyatt. What would 
uh, the complaint against Ellis Wyatt be today? It'd be very different. One would be he's in the business of extracting a non-renewable resource. He's a depleter, okay? And there's social costs to extraction that are greater than the private costs. Uh, secondly, he's a polluter. Uh, since oil, when burned, uh, emits uh, uh, the different criteria of pollutants. Uh, he would be accused of being a climate disruptor since there's CO2 emissions uh, with uh, oil uh, burning. And if he politically was active and he supported candidates who um, uh, had a different view from the politically correct, he would be called a denier, sort of like uh, what Charles Koch is getting uh, hit with today. Uh, but the reality is that oil and gas and minerals aren't depleting resources, but they're expanding resources in a free market. Okay. Um, and that uh, pollution, the criteria of pollutants, uh, have gone, been going down uh, uh, about 40% less on average today than in the 1970s. More uh, progress is expected. The, the air is much cleaner today than when I was growing up in the 1970s. I remember I, I had a smog cough. I played tennis outside and I had a little smog cough in uh, Houston, Texas. Um, and the climate change debate is a huge debate, uh, but it looks like, uh, like with a lot of things, the truth is in the middle. There is uh, some uh, global warming climate change because of the human contribution uh, through uh, about 90% uh, emissions from fossil fuels, cement, and about 10% from land use issues but that the warming is much less than some of the climate models say. And so there's a school of thought called the global lukewarmers. And uh, I would include myself in that group. And guess what? At the lower end of warming, uh, many climate economists see significant benefits and not only cost uh, to uh, moderate uh, warming. And with the CO2 fertilization effect, uh, CO2 being a a plant food, that there's, uh, we're not sure whether the externality on net is positive or negative. We're not even sure if there's a problem. Uh, even before you turn to the public policy, uh, you know, what can you do about it if you assume it's a problem? Uh, so the news is, uh, I think, really good here. Now the looters, uh, Hugo Chavez, uh, remember him? Uh, you know, he, he, uh, he, he was a resource destroyer, a resource immobilizer. Uh, you know, uh, Mexico, Venezuela, these places should be more prosperous than, than Texas and the United States because they have all these resources and they have a better climate, but uh, they're very poor. Uh, all the geopolitical uh, unrest, uh, looters at work, uh, socialized, uh, oil and gas uh, sectors, creating the so-called resource curse. Our friend Al Gore, uh, if you assume he has good intentions, the road to hell is paved uh, with good intentions, uh, an insight out of uh, the Hayek tradition. Uh, Obama, uh, which is sort of back to uh, Jimmy Carter energy policy, even though there's some new rationales. Uh, Jimmy Carter thought we were running out of oil and gas and therefore we needed all the government intervention. Obama has a different rationale and that is uh, the climate change rationale. Uh, Obama is trying to hold back an energy boom that's happening uh, despite of him. Um, in the last five years, uh, oil and gas production on private and state lands has gone up a full third. On federal land, uh, it's down. Uh, uh, Two very different stories here. Uh, the days required to get a permit to drill on uh, in Ellis Wyatt's uh, Colorado, less than a month, but on federal lands, more than 200 days. Two very different stories. One is more politicized than the other. Uh, uh, areas of oil and gas resources are, uh, that are believed to be there that are off limits are significant. And of course, we have the whole green energy facade, which I hadn't talked about much today, 
um, uh, all the subsidies, all the crony capitalism uh, with uh, wind and solar projects uh, in particular. You've heard a lot about Solyndra, et cetera. Uh, and this is a cartoon that caught my eye, how green energy works. You give me your green and I give you the taxpayers uh, green. Uh, so it's sort of ironic, but the progressive left that so suspicious of corporations and backroom dealing is having to put up with all this cronyism uh, on, in the energy sector. And there's a shared narrative today. It's repeated so much, you're supposed to think it's, it's true, but it's not. That uh, still peak oil is coming. It's not going to occur as soon as we thought. Peak oil, peak gas, but it's coming. Well, uh, they're, they're not only in the wrong year or decade, they're in the, in the wrong century. And by then, our energy alternatives will be very different uh, from what we uh, are thinking about today. Uh, pollution uh, somehow is getting worse, or it's a, it's a major topic. And the, and the statistics from US EPA do not support this, but what they've done is they've redefined carbon dioxide, CO2, uh, as a pollutant, uh, and that's why they are, uh, have this narrative. Uh, the, there's a, the narrative that the world is warming as feared and weather extremes are increasing. Well, you have to go to the data and you have to go to the peer-reviewed literature and it doesn't uh, support that. And why should we assume that the human influence on climate is bad? It might be bad, it might be good. Um, uh, and I think the global lukewarming warming school is starting to win. And the, the view that conventional energy, oil, gas, and coal is unsustainable, I would argue it's becoming more sustainable, less, and the major threat to energy sustainability isn't the free market, but uh, statism itself, government intervention that makes energy less affordable, less abundant, uh, less reliable. So the free market counterattack that's going on today, and I'll wrap up, uh, free market economics is, is powerful in this debate. If, uh, if we learned one thing from the 1970s is that price controls create shortages, and this is now standard in the economics textbooks. The economists are pretty much all on board that price controls make things worse rather than better. We have also ultimate resource theory, sort of the Ellis Wyatts that are coming up with uh, uh, new supplies of oil and gas we didn't think were there. And this gets back to the Julian Simon view of the world uh, that human ingenuity is the ultimate resource and it is why so-called depletable resources uh, don't deplete but expand in a business economic sense. Uh, sort of back at you, the free market movement now has a lot more resources than we did 10, 20 years ago to fight the energy battles against cap and trade and the carbon tax and the rest of it. Uh, my organization, the Institute for Energy Research and our advocacy arm, the American Energy Alliance, are very involved in this. Uh, other great work is being done by the Competitive Enterprise Institute, Heritage Foundation, and other groups. Uh, check your premises. A gentleman out of the, the Ayn Rand Institute where he used to work there, Alex Epstein has formed his own uh, group called the uh, Center for Industrial Progress, and he is challenging uh, the environmental left, the progressives, that fossil fuels are wonderful, and you can buy his t-shirts, I love fossil fuels, and the rest of it, he's going right at them on moral ground, bringing in a lot of objectivist argument. Uh, Google his name. Uh, in his organization, you can find out more, but it's, he's, it's a wonderful new voice uh, in the debate to join us economist types uh, who argue more on utilitarian grounds. And we have the, the plain realities of an oil and gas boom, green energy failures, and the global warming pause for the last 15 plus years that is just bringing the debate in our directive, but our direction, but, we, okay, uh, but um, uh, the, good, the good news is we have uh, these new realities, but we're facing the shared narrative where there's so many people just 
saying the same things over and over as if if they say it enough times, it is true. So the conclusions um, are energy is a commanding height of the economy. The status have always wanted to control it with good reason. Uh, Ayn Rand's energy themes and Atlas Shrugged uh, resonate today. Indeed, she was prophetic. And the battle between energy producers and leaders continues. And we need uh, objectivist insights, the objectivist philosophy to help us uh, win this fight. Okay? You mentioned in one of your slides that there's a lot of um, you know, talk about green energy failures, um, but isn't there um, a lot of potential for new innovation investment in green energy? Um, and it shouldn't necessarily be dis, uh, dismissed from an objectivist perspective because really it's where the next big leap could come from as well as going out and converting shale or fracking. Uh, I didn't give a whole lot of explanation for why politically correct or green energies are market losers. And um, uh, remember that for most of mankind's history, when we were uh, immersed in, in poverty, that the market share of renewable energy was 100%. Solar, wind, uh, uh, falling water, and particularly biomass, burning uh, wood, uh, 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 trees, uh, plants. Um, so the idea that we have to get to renewables as a per se good uh, is flawed. What, what really enabled the Industrial Revolution, the machines of the Industrial Revolution, was a new kind of dense energy, which is oil, gas, and coal. The sun's work over many, many millions of years to create a dense form of energy that uh, even something like a, a, a tree, which is uh, some call uh, baby coal, just doesn't have the same density. So we're all for energy technology that might uh, uh, bring forth new um, uh, energy sources, but uh, wind and solar in particular are the very worst, uh, not only because they're very dilute energies compared to the sun's work over the many millions of years that gave us uh, carbon-based fuels, but they're intermittent. And intermittency is an absolute killer for wind and solar. Uh, uh, because you have to have a uh, battery uh, backup. So um, these technologies, uh, even electric vehicles, have been tried by entrepreneurs for uh, uh, well over 100 years, and they just haven't worked. Uh, and even with government subsidies now in their third, fourth decade, uh, they're still not working. So I think the lesson there is that these green energies are, are very uneconomic, and they do have a lot of environmental costs, too. Elon Musk has a set of solar technologies that he's using to put uh, all over the highways for his new electric cars and an opportunity to replace electric car batteries in 90 seconds. Uh, someone who's actually doing a lot of innovation against the, the model of we have electric cars that aren't really performance ready or the next generation. Isn't that the kind of innovation that's actually going to inspire um, a new next generation of technology? Um, all for uh, electric uh, vehicle research, battery technology, um, uh, but uh, when the government decides to intervene to do it, that's a real signal that uh, market sector capital entrepreneurs uh, are not interested. Now, uh, uh, Thomas Edison, believe it or not, talked Henry Ford out of pursuing an electric vehicle because he saw the economics there, and uh, Edison almost went bankrupt trying to develop uh, an economical battery to make electric vehicles work. And we've had a lot of, uh, of, the, of the same impetus uh, uh, in the last hundred years and it's all uh, turned up the same, turned out the same, and so that's just a signal that 
uh, we need to respect the market and uh, to get government subsidies out of the out of the electricity battery field. I have uh, two questions. Uh, question number one is: I think everyone in this room would agree that um, involving the government um, doesn't produce a lot of positives. But what about the oil industry and the subsidies that they accept from the government? Uh, there's some. Uh, there's, uh, I think the estimate may be $4 billion a year, extremely small compared to their output versus renewable energy. Uh, to clean out the tax system, it would be easy to get rid of that uh, at the same time you're getting rid of subsidies for all the other energies, including uh, nuclear. Uh, I'm all for cleaning it all out. But wouldn't the oil industry be able to take the high moral ground if they said we're not going to accept these subsidies? Um, I, w I wish there was a, a sort of a, a, a Randian figure uh, to do that. Um, I think uh, the best you could expect from the oil industry uh, a leader or API, and they should do it, saying, uh, yes, we'll get rid of our subsidies, but you have to end subsidies for all other energies. Okay, we can agree to disagree on that one. The second uh, point of view, um, the solar, the cost of solar energy, utility scale potential solar energy has dropped about 75 percent in the last five years, and it is about a third away from grid parity. Why is that a bad thing, without regard for subsidies? Okay. Um, the problem is that solar is uh, on the grid is not uh, an industrial energy in the sense that it is intermittent. The idea of solar by itself, not only is it more expensive, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very inferior energy because you don't have it continuously. So what is a subsidy that you're paying for the fossil fuels to always be there when the solar uh, is not? Um, so to me, solar is just a starter energy uh, off the grid, uh, and it is sort of the beginner industry to uh, set a transition to the uh, conventional energies of oil, gas, and coal. You've covered um, a good bit of it, but do you, act, do you have the actual prices of, of what the electric costs are, electricity costs are in the different, in the different uh, technologies? And also, given that it's intermittent, that the, that the renewable, quote, renewable green is, is intermittent, does that mean that you need to maintain, when you compare average cost for each, that actually you're, you're, uh, you're, you're going to be dealing with incremental cost from the coal uh, a traditional side against average cost, which makes the economics even, even uh, less attractive for the green side? Yeah, the uh, Department of Energy has levelized costs for the new technologies. If you build a gas-fired uh, electric generation versus uh, wind, solar, uh, uh, wind is probably uh, uh, 20, 25 percent greater than gas-fired, uh, and solar is significantly higher than that. We heard uh, one-third, but I would say, uh, the Department of Energy would say, uh, that uh, it's at least uh, 50 to 75 percent higher. But then the other problem is this intermittency, as you say. So to really to go apples to apples, you'd have to add uh, uh, storage uh, cost to wind or solar, or you'd have to uh, add a cost in for the firming up from uh, oil, gas, and coal. And the problem is these gas plants, they're, they're going like this because wind and solar are going like this, uh, and you're getting incremental pollution from these plants because they're not built to go like that. It's sort of like stop and go uh, traffic. Uh, and the analogy I use is imagine even if wind or solar was cheaper, okay, would you buy a car that was cheaper that had a trick motor where you never knew when the motor would be on or off? And the answer is no. Even if it's cheaper, you wouldn't want it. I just want to hear your your perspective of the future of energy sources because we have seen like uh, these so-called green energy sources are not uh, that profitable and and are not sustainable. So are we going to 
stay in in the traditional oil and coal and and all of that or um, are we tending more to nuclear energy or, um, what do you think yeah um i haven't talked much about uh nuclear uh is that your question um Sorry? but nu nu nuclear can't compete against natural gas fire generation the other thing about nuclear that's a problem in the old days nuclear plants got approved by state public utility commissions where the uh, the electricity company had the whole nuclear plant as rate base. They got a rate of return on this huge, uh, huge cost asset. Now with uh, uh, deregulation uh, where utilities don't necessarily have to build their own power plants and have rate base, uh, why would you build a nuclear plant if you can't get a long-term contract for someone to buy that power out 10, 15, 20 years? You can't get those long-term contracts. So nuclear is uh, simply not competitive, and that's one reason why Obama wants to throw $18 billion in subsidies at nuclear to try to get some new plants going. I just wanted you to expand on, on, on this, this issue of nuclear energy. It's always been subsidized by the government. It's uh, wrapped up in a firestorm of controversy over the, you know, the anti-humanists and the rest of that. I wanted to hear more about uh, the future of nuclear and other um, sources. Well, it's, uh, uh, it, it's not competitive, and I don't see it being competitive for a long time. I look at nuclear as a backstop technology, uh, uh, something that's technically possible, but just not uh, economic. And, uh, you know, I, I see us as being in an energy-rich world out many, many thousands of years. Uh, hopefully, we're not going to run out of energy before we run out of the sun. I think there was a joke by Julian Simon. Uh, well, I won't get into that, but uh, I think we have millions of years of uh, affordable uh, energy left. How's that for being optimistic? <laughs> and I don't know about the 90% hyperinflation chance for next year, but I hope not. <laughs> okay, well, uh, that's, a, that's a good positive note to uh, end on. And by the way, about a week or so ago, one of uh, Obama's uh, chief uh, advisors on these issues said it's time for a war on coal, and he's uh, propagating regulations to do just that. So uh, the information we have here is absolutely relevant. Anyway, thanks a lot uh, for your comments.